Okay. Thank you for the um, nice comments for those of you who are in the morning session. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We're going to kind of take it to the next level here. And so uh, let's get going. My um, favorite video to start a session like this with, let's go. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gangster when I'm coming to see you. That was Mike Dubin. In 2014, Mike went out for a beer with a buddy in California. They were complaining about the price of razor blades, which, as you know, are often locked away behind a glass case inside a CVS or wherever you go. And uh, they decided to do something about it. So they started Dollar Shave Club. They put that little video up on the Internet on a Friday. They had 15,000 orders by Sunday. They did $10 million of business in their first year, which is pretty good for a first year startup. Built the business up to $150 million in sales, sold it two years ago to Unilever for $1 billion. That was a profitable beer for Mike and his buddy. So what did Mike do? Mike simply told a different story than Gillette had been telling us all for over 100 years. Gillette owned the men's uh, grooming market and women's, frankly, with over 80% of the market share. Uh, Schick owned another, basically the rest of it. And all they had been selling for 100 years was features and benefits. One blade, two blades, three blades, Teflon so it doesn't scrape you know, closer shave, rotating head, as he said, a back scratcher, a laser pointer, whatever. And he said, you know, we don't really want all that. And we really don't want to pay the price we're being charged for these blades. So I'm going to make it a lot cheaper. He made cheap cool with his little video. So can you change a market by simply changing your story? Well, Mike proved absolutely that you can. Let's look at another video, and uh, thank you. I learned that I have to turn my microphone off. Here we go. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Hello? Captain? I think he's gone. Fair enough. So what was going on there, other than it was highly amusing in my little world? Well, there were two different stories going on. The captain of the aircraft carrier, the destroyer, had one story going on in his head. He was the second most powerful... Uh... Oh, no volume? 
Jake, are you are you guys hearing me? Can you just type in the chat? Yeah. Could you hear that uh, commercial? Okay, taking that as an all yes, thank you. So the captain um, had one story going on and the guy in the lighthouse told it had a totally different story going on in his head. And that's what happens in a lot of our communications, especially in business. We have different stories going on in our heads. And uh, we all, as you, I think all of you, I looked at the list quickly. I think all of you were on my session this morning. If you weren't, please just say I wasn't in the chat. But we, the problem is we are interpreting everything coming at us in terms of a story. That's the model that humans use to, and, uh, to interpret and organize information. And when you've got two totally different stories going on, especially in sales, that's a problem. So what I'm going to do is talk a little more detail here about what I started on this morning, which was um, how to dig a little deeper into uh, how to use stories in a sales environment. Sorry, just had to catch the deck up there. Um, everyone was there this morning, so you know me. My name is Doug Keeley. I run a company called Stories Rule. I, we help our, company, our clients power sales, leadership, and culture through the use of business storytelling. Really simple. So Alec Baldwin told us the ABCs in Glengarry Glen Ross, one of my favorite movies, always be closing. And I would put that that's a real old model. It doesn't work anymore. I've changed it now to DEF. You have to be different. You have to connect with people on an emotional level, not just a left brain level. And you can do that by being empathetic, by being emotional, having fun, goodness forbid, uh, that you have fun at work. And then the third F is not actually for fun. It's for being unforgettable. And that's where stories help. They help us differentiate. They help us change the conversation and make it more emotional. And, they, and, and a great story is unforgettable. I told the story this morning of the FedEx helicopter, my favorite all-time business story. Why? Because I read that story in a newspaper in the 1980s. And I still remember the story in 2020 and where it was in the newspaper where I read it. That's the impact. I can tell you that in 1984, when Apple launched the Macintosh, they took a 12 page ad out in Newsweek. And I remember it was right before Christmas 1983. And I remember where I read that insert. And I remember the line, owning a Mac will make the difference between getting home in time for dinner and getting home in time for Christmas. And everyone wanted to be home in time for dinner. How do I remember a line from an ad that many years later? Because it was couched in a story and I remember the story. So I talked about assertions, facts, and stories this morning. I'm going to quickly do that again just to make sure because this is the, the foundation of everything. Um, an, oops, sorry, an assertion might be uh, at Mazda, we have the most safe vehicles on the road. Our safety record is above none. You can show me the little chart on the internet that shows you how I stack up from everyone else. My one of my clients is Mazda, and, and one of their um, executives put this slide up at a meeting that I was part of four years ago, and I remembered it as Nancy. And he said, one of our salespeople, our sales managers, received a note with a photograph uh, in his email. So this would have been four or five years ago, and here's what it said. Here was the photo, a completely destroyed car in, a, in the middle of a highway. And the type read, hi, my name is Nancy. I just have to thank Mazda for building such a safe car that my daughter-in-law and granddaughter had a severe accident in. As you can see from the picture, it's amazing that they both survived. People are talking about what a safe car Mazda is. Thank you again. Six months ago, I had to buy a car for my son who was going off to play semi-professional hockey in a very snowy part of Canada. What kind of car did I buy him? No question about it. I bought him a Mazda because I remembered Nancy. I remembered her name and I remembered exactly what happened. Can stories help you sell? Absolutely. Does that story make the assertion that Mazda makes that they're the best or their numbers, their statistics better? I would argue absolutely. So one of the reasons for that is that um, stories touch us on all of our levels. And I 
if you're taking notes, just either write down the words or if you're doing it by hand, you can draw this. All human beings operate on five levels. We have a spirit level, so something that's bigger than us. We have our right brain, which is our imagination. Our left brain, which is our intellect. We have our hearts, which is our passion as human beings. And then we have our hands, which do the work and bring ideas to life. Most businesses work predominantly, if not entirely, on two of the four, five levels. And uh, you can type in the chat which two you think they are. And I'm going to give you in the technology industry the spirit level. Do you don't want to know what Google's big spirit idea is? It's to put all the information in human history at anyone's hands, anytime, anywhere, on any device, therefore democratizing information. When Apple started, their big spirit idea was to put a dent in the universe, making insanely great products. Well, most businesses run on intellect and hands. Thank you, Julie. Um, here's the plan. Work the plan. Here are the numbers. We got to hit the numbers. Where does great human performance come from? Great human performance comes from the other three. Here's a big idea that I'm excited about. Let's put all the information in history at anyone's fingertips from creativity, thinking differently than everyone else is thinking and doing things differently than you did yesterday. And then passion, you do think when you're passionate about things, you tend to do them really well. Well, stories are great stories are amazing because they touch us on all of those levels. We cry at movies when the story really touches us. We cry reading books when the story really touches us. We cry when someone tells us a story. And crying is not bad. Crying is a good thing because it means that whoever you're connecting with is connected emotionally. So stories also add value. Many of you will know about the significant objects a study that was done in 2009, but maybe many of you don't. I shouldn't have assumed that. So here's what happened. In 2009, two guys decided they wanted to study whether a story could add value to things. So they went out and they bought 100 objects in thrift stores and hired 100 writers to write a fictitious story about the object. They then put all of those objects attached to the stories up on eBay. And the, an object, an Ireland cow plate, which they bought for a buck, sold for $41. A felt mouse that they bought for 50 cents sold for $62, etc. The number that they were able to sell things for was astronomical. It was thousands of percentage compared to what the original price was in some case. So it was only because they had hired writers and the writers wrote a fabulous story about each of these little pieces of chachka that the, that the value went up. So stories indeed can impact what the value of an object is. Stories also stick. I proved that, I hope, with my FedEx story, but let's do a quick little test. I think this is fun. I'm going to read you a quick list and I want you to memorize it. John walked in the roof, Bill picked up the eggs, Pete put on the helmet, Jim gave a speech, Frank built a boat, Harvey flipped the electric switch, Ted wrote the play. Okay, who put on the helmet? Who walked in the roof? Who wrote the play? I'd be surprised if any of you could get two out of that. Let me give you a different list. Santa Claus walked in the roof, the Easter Bunny picked up the eggs, the Viking put on the helmet, John F. Kennedy gave a speech, Noah built a boat, Edison flipped the switch, Shakespeare wrote the play. Now, the chat is too slow to do this in real time, but I'm pretty confident that if I asked any of you, so who put on the helmet, you'd be able to say the Viking, who was walking on the roof, Santa Claus, who picked up the eggs, the Easter Bunny, who gave the speech, Kennedy, etc. So why are we able to remember all of those so easily without even thinking about it? Because we have a story in our brains, which is attached to each of the actions. And that story is triggered when, I, when we read that little sentence. That's the power of stories. They stick in our brains. So as salespeople, what you want to do is put stories in the brains and the hearts of your customers and prospects so that they remember you. Now, here's the, the model for all stories. That's the most important part. All stories start with a time and a place. Once upon a time, yesterday afternoon, when I was 18 years old, when I was a teenager in Des Moines, Iowa, 
They start with a time and place long time, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. It doesn't have to be specific, but it has to be specific enough that you can say it's a time and a place. Next, all stories have a sequence of events. Something happens. And typically more than one thing has to happen to make it a good story. If I say yesterday I was standing in my backyard, okay, I got a time and a place yesterday backyard and a rock fell on my head. Don't stand in the backyard. Well, maybe that's technically a story, except there was only one event that happened, the rock fell. So it's a pretty bad story. So you want to have a sequence of events, something happened. The classic story model is someone's there, they have a problem, the problem's resolved, they live happily ever after. Next, all stories are about people or pets, mostly about people. So anytime you can connect your story to a person and make the listener care about the person, you're going to have a good story. Most, if you study most of the films that have flopped at the box office and the series that I give up on Netflix after a couple of episodes because I go, it's just totally lost me. It's because you stop caring about the character or you never care about the characters in the first place. So if you don't care whether a character lives or dies, the story's a waste of time, move on. No one will care. We also care about pets. If you're a dog lover, do not mess with my dog, Bailey. And if you tell me a story about your dog and I'm a dog lover, I'm gonna connect with you. Sort of generally animals, but we don't care about inanimate objects, which is why case studies don't work. Unless we work for an organization, we don't care whether it lives or dies or if we have stock in that company, we don't care. Next. The little exclamation mark, good stories have something unexpected happen in them. You know, you, again, you've been to movies, you can see the ending coming and you're disappointed. And in business, all stories have to have a point. You do not want to be telling stories that don't have a point at the end of it. All right, basic story pattern. When you tell a story, give a relevant statement. I want to tell you something that I think could clarify that. Let me give you an example of what I was just talking about. Um, you know, something happened to me when I was a teenager, which is really similar to what we're talking about today. So give a setup, think of the setup or the relevant statement as like the headline in a newspaper. It makes you go, okay, I get why I'm reading this particular story and I'm interested in it. So I'm going to go through the story. Then you tell your story and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. And then you make a point at the end. Very, very simple structure. Business stories need to be two or three minutes long. Two is perfect. If you do it in 30 seconds, it's probably not got enough detail to get me engaged. If you take five minutes, I'm long gone. So two to three minutes, go for two. Remember what I said this morning, you are always Yoda, not Luke. Don't be the hero. It's self-aggrandizing. Make your customer or someone else the hero, but not you. You, I'm going to talk just quickly about how you can use stories in different contexts. Number one, to connect with people. So that's personal stories that show others that you have something in common with them. To clarify an idea, technology people, as a generalization, I've spoken at hundreds and produced of hundreds of different technology conferences. Everyone walks out on stage and goes Bleh, and just vomits a lot of data and assertions and nothing sticks. You can use stories to clarify. Let me give you an example of that. You tell a quick story, got it. Stories are great at simplifying, taking complex information, simplifying it down. Stories are great to change perspective. Um, the Mike story changed perspective on an industry. I showed you the pit stop story this morning. That changed perspective, hopefully, on what is and is not possible. And then, as I've always uh, already said, you use stories to help make something stick because stories are sticky. And the same three types of stories that I talked about this morning. You need to be able to tell your company story in an engaging way fast. You need to be able to tell customer success stories, not a case study. And you need to be able to tell personal stories. So quickly, let's go over those again. Your company story. I think the best way to tell a company story is to use uh, an example. So I was one of my clients, a company called iGel. They make op an operating system, a Linux based operating system that you can load on any junky computer off a USB. And they make small, inexpensive uh, computers as well, thin clients. 
for those of you in the tech space. And, and when they say, well, how would you tell the story? I would say, uh, we make an operating system for any computer that you can get on a USB, you plug it in and it's magical. Let me give you an example. Our client, Jeremy, at and then I would tell the story of the life insurance company that I talked about this morning from the point of view of the end client. So I'd make a really simple statement about what we do, and then I tell a story to show it in action, and the story shows the why and the how. The story is what's going to stick. Customer success story, I don't want to beat this to death. All stories are about people. So there's only two ways to do this. If you know the customer and what their pain point was, then you talk about the customer and their pain point and how they resolved it with your help. You're never the person who comes in on the white horse and solves the problem. You're just the enabler. And uh, another way to do that, if you don't know who the customer was, is to, int is to connect the, the person you're talking to by experience, by their experience. So let me explain that. Uh, I have a client in the technology space. They, do, they have all these horrible case studies on their website. They're just brutal. I, no one reads them. They're a waste of time and money. And one of them one day was about a hospital and doing surveys in, in um, I think, or the maternity ward it was, and about what the customer experience was and what a pain checking in and checking out is. But they didn't know anything about the customer, the IT person, or anything. So the way I taught them to tell that story is you connect with your audience by saying, you have kids. Yep. Or maybe not. Nieces, nephews. Yep. So you've been to a hospital, yes, with your wife or husband, yes, or partner, yes. So do you remember what the experience was like? Oh, absolutely. It was either great or it was horrible. They'll all have an internal story about that. And then you say, well, we understand that. And we did a project for our client and it was designed around you and the experience you had. And our job was to make that experience consistently get a nine out of 10 or whatever it is on the scale. So you've connected the lister to the story by what the experience was about because you didn't know what the story in this case of the IT person at the hospital was. Make sense? You can always do that. You can always find a way to connect them. You want them to identify with the person that the story is about, even if it's them. And then the last thing is personal stories. I strongly recommend that you go you literally back through your life and you think, what are the big decisions that I made, good and bad, and make a note of them? What are the events in my life that had the biggest influence on me? And what are the people in my life that had the biggest influence on me? And capture what those stories are. And those three buckets are really simple. You're going to use those stories constantly when you're trying to connect with prospects or when you're coaching people and you know in coaching situations very often you say hey i hear you had a problem the other day and the person you're talking to immediately gets defensive if you change the coaching environment and say oh i heard about what happened yesterday funny that happened to me when i was 30 and i had just started at whatever the company is and then you tell them the story of what happened they're now listening to you and your story and how it resolved and they're always going to be smart enough to figure out, okay, I hear what he's, he or she is telling me now. So you use personal stories. You should have a library of all three of these. As I say, these are must-have stories, in my opinion. Um, here's how you tell it. I have exactly three minutes. That's okay. First of all, the context statement, which I talked about, which is the newspaper headline. Then you introduce the characters. If it's a personal story, it's about you. If it's a um, success story, it's about your customer. If it's a company story, depending on the context, if you use the little formula I gave you, you're going to give a one-line statement and then introduce the customer. You're going to say, here's what happened in the story. You're going to end strong, make an ending. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I say on, see on stage and they're out there for half an hour and then they go, oh, okay, thank you very much. It's been great to be here. And you go, really? Would you ACDC end a concert by going, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, wherever, nice to be here in Philadelphia. Is it Philadelphia? And then finally, re make your point. What do you want them to conclude from your story? It's a really simple, very linear outline and you got to get it in two minutes or less. 
Let's watch a couple of examples. Well, I probably have time for one example of someone who I think um, did that in a, in a really um, clever way. In fact, uh, you, most of you won't have seen this commercial. This is for a financial services company in Canada called Wealth Simple, and they created a character. This is Mike. This is Mike. There are 457,000 Mikes in Canada. This is the story of one of them. Mike was sort of a nerd. This is Mike visiting his grandma. You should get out more. You should get out more. This is Mike getting out more. He loved computers, spreadsheets, finance, and computers. Get out. He won a stock picking contest at 11. That's the kind of Mike we're talking about. Wow. And then one day, Mike found himself all teed up for a big job in finance. You know, climb the ladder, make a partner, conquer the world. We own this town! But Mike started to wonder, how come only some people got the best financial tools? <laughs> what about everyone else? Then Mike had a very Mike idea. He used a computer to start a company. Pretty soon, a million people were using Wealthsimple. That's what he called it. No matter who you are or where you're from, now you could manage your money in a simpler, smarter way. Because wealth works better when everyone has access to it. Not just the few. Everyone. So what did they do? They created a story about Mike and the CEO's real name is Mike. And that commercial played in Canada during football, like the, the Super Bowl and, and hockey games while there was hockey. And people would stay and watch the TV. I heard many stories of people who said, oh, my God, we, we broke during the commercials to go get a beer and some chips. And everyone was standing and saying, watch this commercial. So what did they do? They humanized financial services, which is virtually impossible. They put a real kid in the middle of it, a guy, Mike, and they told a story that everyone loved. And that well, Simple's doing very, very well as a result. Okay, it's 4.30. Um, my time is up. Doug at storiesrule.ca. Uh, I ran out of chat time. If you have any questions, throw it in the chat and I'll try and answer it really quickly. Um, and uh, be ha I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I hope that was the that there was value in that for you in the fastest storytelling session I have ever done in my entire year. Woohoo! Oh, there's a QA and a in Whova too. So uh, if you have questions, just go and throw them at me in the app. Thank you for reminding me of that, Jake. And uh, have a great rest of the conference. I might see you at the um, cocktails, the virtual cocktails. <laughs>